Hi, I'm Diana. And I'm Susanna. And welcome to Global Caveat, the podcast where we demystify global health. On today's episode, we'll be exploring the global burden of disease and looking at how connected we really are. So the world's a pretty large place. And according to recent stats, what is it, like 7.2 billion people on this planet? but that's like a lot going on and we don't really know a whole lot about everything. Yeah, the world is a really big place, but I think shockingly to some people, it's really big, but it's also really small. And I think there are a lot of instances where we realize how small the world is. And then you you have that Disney song, like, it's a small world after all. (laughs) Um, But I think that's especially true for global health because with how much the world is interacting with each other, there are a lot of health issues that not just certain areas are facing, but a lot of different parts of the world are facing at the same time, maybe in different ways, but that's global health, right? There's a lot of different issues, multiple issues that multiple communities are experiencing. Yeah, global health is basically just public health applied to the entire world, and which is pretty intense when you think about it when there's that many people. And first, if we define public health, it's just understanding how different diseases and health disparities and really just how anything affects the outcome of our health on a larger scale than just an individual or isolated community. And applying it to the globe seems like a daunting task and it almost seems impossible. But then there's the whole global burden of disease study, which took like 20 years to make because so many people were like, we want this, but we don't want this because we just don't want to know about it, right? Because you want to know, but it's kind of like, You have three doors and they all have impending doom behind them, but you don't want to open any of them, but you also really want to at the same time. I don't know. Like you want to know, but you don't want to know. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. I think it would be helpful then to maybe talk about what the global burden of disease is, maybe define it a little bit, because I think it's thrown around a lot in global health, especially nowadays as people are um, majoring in it and learning more about it. And you always hear like the burden of disease or the burden of smoking on a country. But what does that actually mean? So if we step back and we just define it, it's the metric that allows us to analyze like all of the diseases and ailments really that are happening around the world to every country and in every population and it gives us this ability to not just analyze different countries but compare them to each other so that way if we know something's happening in one country for let's just go with like wow I can't think of any diseases right now that's terrible think of um, diabetes yeah diabetes so if you know that diabetes is happening in like America and you can also compare to some place like Australia both places that that tend to have a little bit more processed foods. So you can see how maybe Australia is treating it and how they're successful or not successful. And you can take that and you can also apply it here because you'd be able to see the same occurrences throughout the population. You can just see how the numbers are shifting and everything. So you can see how a treatment or a way of going about trying to figure out how to solve it is actually working or not, right? So you see how the different ailments are affecting people in either decreasing someone's quality of life or just literally killing them, right? Yeah, and I think the global burden of disease, those studies are really important. I mean, I think that's a good thing about this effort, right, on on the global scale, because like you said, if we can start comparing, oh, in this region of the world, there's a specific burden of diabetes. But in other areas of the world, we see the population doesn't really have a high rate of diabetes. And then we can actually start asking questions on why that is. And then people can learn from each other, right? And hopefully whatever governing system or public health or medical professionals within that country can start doing research, looking at it and start implementing interventions or programs to help combat the high rates of diabetes within their community, um, within that country. So on another note, I think that one of the biggest things with the Global Burden of Disease Project is just that more people have become aware of non-communicable diseases. Because so many people think of health and just global health and just 
public health the world and everything and only think infection like people are like oh my god there's zika virus oh my god there's ebola is happening here and there and now you see something like a little burden of disease and it's like oh mental health is like really a major problem everywhere and i think that that alone is like one of the major major things to come out of that because it's something where we always knew it and it's like oh we know it but we're not really going to do a whole lot about it but now it's like here are these like insane numbers that are like oh my gosh this is a problem like we really need to address it And I'm so glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people assume that the low middle income countries have a large burden of infectious diseases and that the higher income countries face a lot of the non-communicable diseases. That's only half of the truth, I think. A lot of the non-communicable diseases, the global burden is significantly with the low middle, middle income countries as well. So what you see is with the low middle income countries, they have high rates of non-communicable diseases and they have high rates of infectious diseases because it's not just people are facing, you know, things like Ebola, (laughs) which was contained in a very specific region, but but also just things like diabetes, like we mentioned earlier, um, it's really prevalent and it's not limited to just, it's not a rich people problem. It's not a rich country problem. A lot of low middle income countries have a double burden yeah yeah exactly so yeah and i i also think it's important to note that while it did take them 20 years to come out with the first study it wasn't just because there was so much data like yes it was because there was so much data but it was also so much pushback from so many other countries only recently have different nations been in a place where they are willing to actually work towards becoming healthier and actually working towards improving their population quality of life population like morbidity and mortality rates and they actually want people to be healthy and happier which i think is also interesting that it took such a long time for countries to realize like oh we need to stop well of course they're still comparing themselves with other countries because what would life be without that it's like <laughs> competition yeah. going on but they're still like much more geared towards being like oh we need better quality of life and better health and everything so this is something that's like allowing all these different countries to actually compare themselves with their even just like their neighbors like Norway to Sweden or something like that I do have a question slash critique though because this this global burden of disease these studies are so meta I feel like you know when it comes to data when you look at uh, large populations there are a lot of people that slip through the cracks that you don't see in your data And those people tend to be the ones that are most marginalized in the community. So in these global burden of studies, and this is just one global health researcher asking another global health researcher for your critique, right? Because for me, I think there is definitely value in this. But I'm also like, but how will it actually benefit those smaller groups of people that really need public health interventions or really need some kind of program or attention and funding. (laughs) Um, But they're just not getting it because it's not, it doesn't come up in the radar of global burden of disease data. Yeah. My interpretation of just in like in regards to making these different types of studies and surveys and scales and just everything, I feel like there's such a difficult, like such a daunting and difficult task in creating something that can be culturally recreated in every single place, right? So like that's a huge aspect and having just the global burden of disease being something that can assess internationally and there is that one scale, but it definitely can't be the only thing. Like there has to be the additional scales and additional studies that complement it. Like you can't just do one and assume that that's going to capture everything properly. A lot of studies that assess trauma and mental health for PTSD all use multiple scales when they're doing it just because you can't possibly capture everything in one because there is no standardized, right? Where I guess, like I, I do, I agree. Like the there's a huge population that's being missed because global burden of disease claims to be this thing that is standardized, but it's not necessarily standardized because all of the data comes from the major organizations yeah and you know when you talk about mental health I always think about depression because cultures define depression so differently and in some areas of the world they don't even have a word for depression Um, it's not like a concept and the way that we understand it in the western world be so different from how other cultures may understand it so then if we're going to claim that one country has a high burden of depression versus another like how do we like you said standardize that how do we compare that? 
I mean, I yeah, guess I, I wish mean, I had an answer. If you, would, if you knew the answer. <laughs> if I knew the answer, I would Life would be, would be so different. <laughs> yeah, if I knew the answer, I'd be writing all sorts of grant proposals <laughs> and being like, please fund me now. Um, I'm working on it. I'm trying to yeah. figure it out. <laughs> I think we all are. I think that's something that I try to do for myself as a global health researcher is to really challenge these really big movements or these big things that um, you commonly know in global health, right? Like global burden of disease. If you're in global health, you've most likely heard that term. And you've most likely probably have seen it in a positive light or maybe just it's so normal. It's so integrated in how you talk about countries and diseases and all of that. But I think it is worth, you know, like what we're doing right now is critically thinking about how, like how far does it go? What are its limitations? Things like that. But that being said, I think it is valuable in the sense that we can, I mean, if, if I'm imagining a global map, of a bunch of different diseases and we're looking at the burden that it places on a country, you know, like how many people die from it or how many people have comorbidities from it. I think that's where we really see, wow, this certain diseases or a lot of diseases, it's not just contained in one area. It's, you know, people are very connected in that way. So speaking of connection, have you heard of the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? No, I haven't. Tell me more about this. Okay. So first of all, disclaimer, I've never played it myself. I just know of the game. So okay. what you do is you take literally any actor, actress, anybody, like any of them, and then you try to make the least amount of connections and a path to Kevin Bacon because Kevin Bacon has been in everything with everyone at some point where like he is less than six degrees of separation from it. If you were to apply that to regular people, that's like you're friends of your 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 friends. Of your friends. Yeah, six. Okay. So here, let me tell you why I was like asking about that. So if you take that concept and you apply it to another field such as global health, it could be something like, oh, there's this disease that's happening in another country, say Ebola, because that's the first thing that comes to mind and most people know what Ebola is. You could be like, oh, that person has Ebola over there in Africa, why is that important to me? Like, I don't care, I'm here in America, right? That's really far away, but no, it's not. Studies have shown we're less than four degrees away from people due to technology and traveling. Now we should be caring more about what's happening around the world because it could just be your city at home and like, knock, knock, who's there? Ebola's here. Now we all have Ebola also. <laughs> so Yeah, and that is so true because a lot of people haven't even heard about chikungunya and it's a dengue-like disease, right? It looks like dengue kind of... Um, Maybe you could relate it to malaria. If you get bit by a mosquito and you get a fever, you get joint aches. And people saw it a lot more in the South, Southeast Asia, Pacific regions, you know, the wet climates. But we are starting to see it in the Americas. And the first outbreak was seen in 2013. And this is actually really important because this disease is rare. Outbreaks are rare, but when they do happen, they're very large. A lot of people get bit, a lot of people get infected, and it requires a rapid response. So in the Americas, now that they're starting to see more cases of this, and very recent too, right? 2013 is not that long ago. Um, they're using a lot of the you know, advertisement tactics on educating the public on how to address or diagnose chikungunya, those things, like people are more aware of how to approach it because, you know, like you said, technology and just being able to communicate and this connection that we have with people, these countries can look to the other countries who have been experiencing this and, and learn how to respond appropriately. So tying this back to the global burden of disease, this is why a study like this is so important. It assesses all of the different diseases and illnesses and analyzes the different effects on morbidity and mortality, meaning either being diseased, ill, or dead, and how we can study these trends and track movements around the world. Yeah, so, you know, maybe to just paint a picture of what that looks like now, using the most recent data available. Uh, from the World Health Organization. Diabetes caused 2.8% of all deaths in the world in 2015. That's about 1.6 million people. In 2000, it was actually at 1 million people, which is about 1.8% of deaths. So death from diabetes has risen. One that people don't often think about is injuries. So things like road traffic injuries. Uh, about 5 million people continue to die from it each year. 
It was thirty-seven thousand deaths each day in twenty fifteen. And just to clarify, like I know that hearing five million deaths due to injury sounds like a lot more than the one point six million from diabetes, but this is very different in terms of how these different illnesses and diseases are assessed. So, as mentioned before, the global burden of disease studies measures how illnesses and diseases impact not only our lives but the lives of those around us. So, it's like an entire quality of life assessment. So, when there's five million deaths each year due to injuries, that's very different from the one point six million for diabetes because an injury is pretty much instantaneous, whereas diabetes also affects your life long term. So, like once you're diagnosed, that's something you have to live with every single day, and then potentially you also die.、Um, Like that was just negative sounding, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, because with diabetes, like you said, it has there are options where people can live with it, whereas injuries, people may or people may not. And I think probably a lot of people do get injured on the daily way more than people get diabetes, which naturally then means that more people are probably dying from injuries too. As we've highlighted in other parts of the conversation, measuring how and why people die is extremely important for just multiple reasons. Right? We need to be able to use it to assess the effectiveness of a country's health system, and it lets us focus our public health actions, which are the different things that, like, you see all of these different agencies. Like, everyone knows what the UN is. It's like their goal for doing things like that. Like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, there's a bunch of different organizations that are trying to make these different actions, but you can't really do much without knowing what the effectiveness of what's already in place and like how to repair that in certain countries. And then some countries are just have enough funds to completely overhaul what they have already, right? Well, I think that, that there's a challenge to this because these studies help us see areas of improvement or potential improvement. That health systems can work towards, that public health programs can be created for or scaled up for, but it's not that easy, right? Even then, like, sure, it's nice to have this data. It's really nice to have this hard, quote unquote, evidence of what the country may need to focus on, but a lot of health issues tend to be behavioral. If not behavioral, they can be managed behaviorally. <laughs> But it's really hard. It turns out to change people's habits and behaviors. Shocking. <laughs> Very hard. Like people know smoking is bad, and smoking has a significant burden on people's health because if you're sick and you're smoking, you're probably going to get worse. But a lot of people just don't want to stop smoking, and it's really hard to do that. I mean, not quite as extreme as smoking, but I really can't get myself to stop eating the hot Cheetos. So, <laughs> <laughs>、um, boba drinks for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to cut it off there before Susanna and I continue to talk about foods that we can't get ourselves to stop eating. But before we go, we want to leave you with one last thought. With the increase in technology and social media, and just how traveling is more accessible, it's actually four degrees, which isn't that far at all. Like that's. So you tell me, I am closer to Beyonce. Yeah. Yes, you're closer to Beyonce. Okay, I didn't say that it was going to be a good or intellectually stimulating thought, but it's great to think of the fact that maybe we're all a little bit closer to Beyonce. So that's our show. Thanks for listening. Susanna and I spend a lot of time making sure that our information is accurate, but there are only two of us. So if you catch something, please let us know. Yes, we're always looking for collaborators for future episodes. Feel free to reach out to either of us. You can find me on Instagram at Sujani S U J A N E E. And you can find me at Clatalist, K L A T T A L Y S T, or you can even shoot us an email at globalcaveat at gmail dot com. And a special thanks to Cordell Glass for writing some kickass music for us, and to everyone who has to listen to us brainstorm out loud. Yes, thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next episode.